Hey everybody, I'm Mariah Lefebvre, a Durham-based mixed media artist and the 2021 Keenan Graduate Arts Fellow in Experimental and Documentary Arts. Thank you all so much for taking the time to come today. Your interest in this project really means a lot to me. I just wanted to start with a little background on the work. In the fall of 2019, at the end of my first semester in Duke's MFA EDA program, I began a series of pieces in which I paired words taken from text messages in my life with drawn images that these words evoked for me. I became fascinated with this idea of taking content from this digital medium that was not designed to last, words that just show up as pixels on screens, communicated often hurriedly, and committing them to a permanent form. I hand drew these pieces with pen on paper, and then often took the additional step of creating cyanotype prints of these drawings. So here's one example of an original drawing, and then a cyanotype print that was made of that drawing. These pieces touched on a broad range of topics, some light, some heavy. I played with weaving in humor, irony, ambiguity, and layers of meaning in my text image juxtapositions. I developed a practice of collecting text messages from my life and making drawings of them that became in part a way of processing life as I was living it. And now to the current iteration of this project. As COVID-19 spread around the world last spring and the daily operations of normal life began to shut down, we all found ourselves having to adjust to an abruptly and dramatically changed world. Everyone I saw was grappling with this new normal. Everyone from my children, suddenly at home and no longer able to attend school in person, to the older people I knew who were suddenly so isolated from contact with loved ones in an effort to protect themselves from the virus. So I worried about all of us and I observed the limited and imperfect ways we were developing for staying connected to one another. But I found myself worried about the members of the recovery community in particular, especially those who are newly clean or actively attempting to get clean as regular operations of daily life shut down, in-person 12-step meetings for those in the recovery community went with them. I'd like to interject a couple quick side notes here. So when I speak about the recovery community, I'm referring to people who have found recovery in 12-step programs. In the case of those who participated in this project, those people were members of Alcoholics Anonymous and or Narcotics Anonymous. But I do wanna acknowledge that recovery can mean different things for different people. And that these certainly aren't the only avenues that people choose. Also, while I am speaking about people who may personally identify as alcoholics or addicts, I view both of those terms as falling under the umbrella term of addiction. And so I'll simply be sticking with that term. I also wanted to include a little back history before launching into the present moment. So the first 12-step program, which was Alcoholics Anonymous, was founded in 1935. Al-Anon, a support group for the loved ones of alcoholics, was founded in 1951. Narcotics Anonymous was started in 1953, and Naranon for the loved ones of addicts in 1971. 12 step programs for a plethora of other substance addictions and process addictions, things such as sex and gambling, have followed in the decades since. In the 86 years since the founding of AA, in-person meetings have provided a supportive lifeline for addicts. Regular meetings create a shared space in which people's struggles with addiction can be shared openly and met with mutual understanding, which breaks through the stigma and shame surrounding addiction. Addicts are uniquely able to understand and support one another. As it says in the NA literature, the therapeutic value of one addict helping another is without parallel. 
Members gather before and after the meetings, they share hugs and coffee. People carpool the meetings because many don't have cars or licenses. Marathon meetings run around the clock during holidays, such as Christmas or New Year's, in which many addicts would otherwise find themselves having to choose between being alone or being in precarious positions. The sense of community and mutual understanding combats the tremendous isolation that addiction brings. So as the pandemic shut everything down, I worried about addicts who were recovering or attempting to find recovery. Obviously everyone was suffering with isolation and the loss of contact with others, but for addicts, the stakes are especially high. Having had close personal ties with addicts and with the recovery community for many years now, I have known and watched many people die from addiction, even when all of the help and resources imaginable were available to them. So it was scary to imagine how much worse things might become in light of the present circumstances. While the general population was trying to stay healthy and avoid the risk of getting sick with and potentially dying from COVID, addicts had not but one but two diseases they needed to remain vigilant about. The protocols for these two illnesses were the exact opposites. COVID protocol said, do not be around people. Addiction recovery protocol said, be around other recovering people. This put addicts in a double bind. Step 12 in the 12 steps invites the individual who has found sustained recovery to carry this message to those who are sick and suffering. This message can be carried in myriad ways. Perhaps most foundational is that of the sponsorship relationship in which sponsor guides sponsee through the steps which brought change and recovery in their own life. Equally vital is the work that members of Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous do when they bring meetings inside of institutions to those who are unable to leave to attend them. COVID upended all of these practices, leaving the recovery community grappling with new ways to stay connected. Some people had virtual meetings, such as Zoom meetings and iPhones for texting and calling available to them, but others were not so privileged those who were in various institutions, whether that was jails, prisons, detoxes, shelters, were both unable to socially distance to protect themselves from an increased risk of COVID and simultaneously unable to tap into the virtual sources of support and connection that those on the outside had. People talk about addicts being a vulnerable population, and this is true. But addicts are also some of the most resilient, creative, and resourceful people I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. It was pretty inspiring to watch the ways in which the recovery community came together as best it could to transition meetings over to Zoom and to support each other. And so while the pieces in this series contain a lot of pain and struggle, I hope that they also show love and highlight how members of this community have continued to care about and protect one another during an enormously challenging time. I pulled my title for this project from a line of text in the basic text of Alcoholics Anonymous. In this passage, co-founder Bill Wilson describes the struggles he faced in early recovery and how he was sometimes tempted to drink. But he writes, I soon found that when all other measures failed, work with another alcoholic which would save the day. It is a design for living that works in rough going.
So this exhibit can be viewed in its entirety virtually. Um, the link for that will be put in the chat for those who don't have it. Um, I also just want to make sure to express my deepest gratitude for those who've been willing to be a part of this project and the enormous trust they've placed in me to both protect their anonymity and to handle their words with care and respect. And now uh, to move on to introducing our panelists. I'm really excited um, for you all to get a chance to hear each of them speak and learn a little bit about each of them. Uh, we have Dr. Nicole Shram Sapcha, Associate Professor of the Practice in the Duke Institute for Brain Sciences. Pedro Lash, Visual Artist and Research Professor of Art, Art History and Visual Studies at Duke University and Kate Daniels, poet and Edwin Mims, professor of English at Vanderbilt University. Um, I will ask each of them to introduce themselves and speak for a few minutes. Um, and the order will be Nicole, Pedro, and then Kate. And Kate will be finishing with sharing a poem of hers that, that I asked her to share with us today. So introducing Dr. Nicole Shram Sapcha. Cocaine and alcohol to mice and rats and measuring their behavior and their brain chemistry and all sorts of things. Uh, and then about 10 years ago, I got fascinated by the fact that the things that I knew about the brain were not things that were commonly understood in, uh, in general society. I would have conversations around the Thanksgiving dinner table with my family that would just be mind blowing. Like, wow, drugs change the brain? What do you mean? Um, and so about 10 years ago, I let go of the basic research lab and started going into um, public education and public policy around addiction because um, there's so much misinformation out there that I really wanted to dispel. And uh, the, the flip side of this is that I have been so bowled over to get connected with people in recovery um, and just to learn how much joy there can be in life from from people who have absolutely hit rock bottom and had the, the will to climb back from that and, and intentionally and consciously choose to engage with life and all the difficulties and struggles and, and fascinating things that happen to us on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, that's my journey and that's why I'm here and I'm so honored to be a part of Mariah's exhibit. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Mariah, for inviting, and it's great to be here. Um, I think the most obvious reason I'm here is because I've been working with uh, Mariah as, as faculty in the MFA program. So that's how we got to meet um, ever since she applied. Um, but I've seen this kind of uh, body of work evolve uh, in addition to her fantastic thesis work, which has nothing to do with this topic and many other projects she's done over time. Uh, including products about Durham, you know, and, and kind of urbanism and so on. So, so it's been great to see the variety of, of, of your work, Mariah. Uh, and in terms of my own kind of experience uh, in relation to this topic, I have myself um, experienced addiction, uh, not just one, but several kinds of addiction and have addressed it in, in, in different ways. Um, and I think one, since this opening kind of section is, is shorter, Two, two things that I want to add to, to stuff that you already said that to me matter a lot is that we collectively untangle criminalization from addiction, right? Uh, American society has uh, criminalized uh, all kinds of addiction in, in terrible, terrible ways. And, but also it has put this, this idea of addiction under the prism of individual responsibility. And uh, what you're doing with your work, I think, speaks volumes of collective, you know, the, not just the importance of collectivity in terms of communities of recovery, but collectivity for a society that refuses to accept that individual responsibility does not, does not actually make sense with topics like addiction, you know? Um, so, uh, so I hope in our conversation, we can address these two topics, you know, uh, because uh, at least the one about criminalization often kind of gets, we all know that, for example, with the recent, um, more, the more recent addiction problem with with uh, pharmaceutical drugs, the approach has been so different than with other addiction. You know, so so I think that's a really important topic. 
Thank you so much, Pedro, for raising that and for everything you said. Uh, Kate? I think you're muted. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to apologize. I'm in the midst of a massive hay fever attack. So I'm on all kinds of antihistamines that to keep me able to speak. So I hope I make sense. Um, I'm speaking to you from Vanderbilt in Nashville where I teach and I'm really pleased to be asked by Mariah to participate in this. I didn't know her and she somehow got connected with me. I suspect it might be have been through Nicole and I'm really pleased to be here with, with Nicole and, and Pedro. Um, I'm a poet and I am someone who has been for decades uh, interested in and involved in an area of humanities study called the health humanities. I lived in Durham many years ago. My youngest child was born at Duke Medical. Um, and at the time I was poet in residence at, at Duke Medical Center. When I moved over to Vanderbilt, I became poet in residence at the medical center there. So my work in health humanities was um, involved with psychoanalysis, with mental illness, but not with anything having to do with um, addiction until about um, 10 years ago when the opioid epidemic, uh, what shall we say, infiltrated my own family very close to me, one of my um, offspring who was uh, in college um, in another state. Um, I'm a poet, I write narrative poetry, I write autobiographically, um, I like to write accessible poetry. I grew up in the working class in the South. Um, it was very natural to me to begin to write somehow about the experience that I was going through because the, I've always written out of the exigencies of my life, regardless of what they were. This one was particularly challenging to write about because it was so terrifying. And it took me a while um, to be able to do that. Uh, ultimately, however, I ended up publishing two books, um, two collections of poetry that, that touch on the subject. Well, more than touch on the subject, focus on the subject. One is a little chat book called Three Syllables Describing Addiction. And I have to give a plug because it was published by a really wonderful little literary press right there in Durham called Bull City Press. And then a longer collection with a lot more poems on this subject in it called um, In the Months of My Son's Recovery. Um, I'm, I'm still writing poems out of this. Um, and Nicole did ask me, I mean, not Nicole, Mariah asked me to read a, um, a poem to you at the end of my introduction of myself. So I guess I'll do that. Um, and I have to say, I present a lot at medical centers and treatment centers and you know places like that, different kinds of audiences. Um, and I'm always interested in the, something that relates very much to this project, reframing addiction, in particular, reframing the language that we choose in which to talk about addiction. And um, I'm always also uh, concerned with the issue of confidentiality and permission. So I always have to say that every poem that I've published on this subject and that I read um, is with the permission of um, not just my, my child who went through this experience, who now uh, has been in recovery for, for um, over six years, um, but also my entire family, because a lot of these poems address the entire family experience, the family illness. This is called Metaphorless, met so without metaphor. The dryness dead center of deep pain, the bone on bone grinding that goes on for months preceding the, sur the surgery. That's the way the parent whose child is using heroin again feels in the middle of the night, unable to sleep, standing at the bedroom window, looking out, just barely conscious of what the moon looks like, drained, gray. The moon is a popular literary image, solipsistic misery, misplaced love, whatever. Tonight, it's nothing but a source of milky light swinging high up in the sky, shining weakly on the bleakness inside and the bleakness outside that has no other meaning but the cold, uncrackable rock of itself. And think about the fact that that poem makes me get kind of choked up <laughs> with asking you to stop. 
to finish with it. Um, thank you so much for, um, for sharing that with us. Um, and I, I also really appreciate what you said about um, the aspect of consent and how you ask your entire family's consent. And that uh, has also been a really important uh, part of my process with this body of work, not only asking for permission to use the, the words from these text messages, but also showing people the piece of the drawings when I'm done with them and making sure they're still comfortable with them. And so if at any point someone said like, no, 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 I really don't want that out there, even though their name's not associated with it, it would be important enough. It would be important to me to, you know, um, lay that drawing to rest at that point in time, because that's such an important, such an important thing. Um, so many different topics that we can touch on with um, the three of you. Um, I wanted to start off by just kind of throwing out a question that um, any any or all of you could respond to and, and may have different perspectives as well. But um, what do you think is the least understood about addiction and, and or what do you think is the most important thing for people to understand about addiction? I'll start that one off in the, the brain science based realm, which is that, um, you know, on, on a few fingers, drugs can change the brain. These are chemicals that actively go in and change the brain. Some people's brains are more vulnerable to that change than others. And it can depend on the person's genetic makeup. It could depend on their balance of stresses and trauma versus resilience and support. Um, but underlying all of that is the reality that no one chooses to become addicted. We might choose to have a good time and party and blow off steam or whatever, but no one chooses to become addicted. That is a consequence of our brain chemistry, our genetics and our, our balance of stress, trauma versus support in our lives. And that's just the one thing that I want everyone to know is that no one chooses addiction and it's um it's something that um no one would choose if they could thank you so much Nicole. i'll go ahead um i would say that uh i a, a lot of my journey through this experience has been through al-anon which is as mariah said at the beginning support group for family and friends of people um, with substance use disorder um, and the first thing that struck me was the fact that this was um, the group of people, the community of people I met um, was not what I had imagined it would be. It was every single kind of person who lives in Nashville, Tennessee. And that was shocking to me. I realized how many stereotypes I had about people whose children um, became addicted to heroin. And I was wrong. And so that, that's the first thing. Um, the other thing is that as I've gone through this, I've come to understand that in fact, most people who, who get in trouble with drugs, you know, whether they become full-blown full addicts or not, most people actually recover. But that is very suppressed in the media representations of everything having to do with addiction and recovery. I mean, the New York Times, for instance, has been doing that slowed down because of the pandemic, but they were doing extraordinarily interesting and important series of feature stories on the opioid epidemic up until the pandemic started. But it, and they were wonderfully, you know, educational, but they never really focused enough on the fact that these were, um, in a certain way, exceptions, um, that most people don't die from addictions. And I, I think that's important too, to understand. Yeah, and I think perhaps as a good connection to that, um, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's it's something that that is not understood, but I I don't think that it's addressed enough that how how addiction is a cultural thing and how uh, one person's addiction can be not considered as such at all by the larger society, and another person's addiction gets, as I said before, criminalized. But it's also in terms of you know what Kate was saying, if you look at for example cocaine. Um, you know, the statistics, statistics have varied slightly over the last 20 years, but, but they've never gone under 90%. Basically, 
ne never has it been that less than 90% of people who die in relation to cocaine die in the war against drugs, right? Like the war on drugs is killing nine out of 10 people to, to save supposedly that the one person that did not recover, you know, that, 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 and of course we want to save that person, but we don't save them through the war on drugs, right? We save them through health programs, through understanding the brain, right? Like Nicole was saying, you know, and so I feel like that, that just the mathematics around the industry of promoting drugs and then promoting the war on drugs is something that we just as a society need to address. It's, it's, um, uh, and addiction is, is is just one component of that, but but that's what I meant earlier about going against the logic of individual responsibility. You know, there's so many forces at play that are so much bigger than us as little individuals. You almost have no no fighting chance. You know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I'll absolutely echo the 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 fallacy of individual responsibility in this world. Um, that you know, none of us chooses our genetics. None of us chooses our childhood traumas, none of us chooses our uh, psychological makeup. Um, but as Kate said, so many people do choose recovery and do intentionally choose um, to do the work of recovery. I have a colleague who might be on the call, Ed Levin, who uses the metaphor that you wouldn't choose to get into a car accident and have your legs destroyed, but if you ever wanna walk again, you have to do physical therapy. And that's the work of recovery. Like no one chooses addiction, but so many people choose recovery and, and that needs to be celebrated a lot more. And I think um, just to kind of touch on that, I think one of the things that's really beautiful about 12 step recovery in particular is that it is free and accessible to all. You know, when you talk about the choice to have recovery and all the factors that come into play, you can't help but think about um, different resources that are available to different people, you know, who want recovery and people who have family that can pay for them to go to very expensive, nice treatment centers and have all the help and support in all areas and others that don't. And there's um, a huge, huge range of experiences. And so I think the fact that there's this, um, you know, uh, Kate touched on this as well in, in commenting about Al-Anon, that it was this, this cross section of society that anyone is welcome, you know, and you're gonna have this mix of people of any walk of life, um, race, socioeconomic class, gender, presentation, I mean, just, you know, all of it. And, um, and I think it's a really beautiful thing to have that resource that's just available to, to anyone who wants it. Um, I wanted to ask Nicole, touching on, um, you know, you talk about kind of the multifaceted aspects of, of addiction and of recovery from addiction. And this project, um, the, the artwork of this project really highlights one of those, which is the human connection and the importance of, of social connection and social support. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak to, in, in your experience and witness, how important a role that plays in an individual's recovery. Oh, absolutely. Um, I've, been in, uh, I've been in seminars with addiction clinicians who will say, you know, we have these medications that work. We gotta, we gotta prescribe these medications, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but then, what is the real work of recovery? Is that changing your your habits in life? You know, when when a stressor happens, um, don't go use. Go do something more constructive, and um, building building that better life, reconnecting with family and friends is is absolutely essential. Um, None of us are just the product of our brain chemistry. Our brain chemistry is the product of our, our whole environment, our social environment and our, our physical environment, all those things. So the brain influences our behavior and our behavior and the response of society and the response of our peers influences our brain. So there's, there's things are absolutely inseparable. So yeah, it's all, it's all so intertwined that <laughs> it's mind boggling in a fun way, but yeah. Can I share an anecdote that sort of supports that? Absolutely. Um, on the on the one year birthday of my offspring, um, who who had an opioid um, addiction and also some alcoholism, but um, went to AA and did um, a, you know a lot of twelve step both in AA meetings and in various treatment centers. 
Um, so on the one year anniversary, I uh, came home, it happened to be Christmas day and I was, you know, it was a very tenuous sort of fragile state. And I had been thinking about, I'm a poet, every word I say is important to me when I'm in a mindful state. I was thinking about what am I gonna say to him? What's the right thing to say that's supportive, blah, 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 blah. So he, he came in and he showed me his chip. He'd gone to the meeting and gotten it. And um, I made my little spiel congratulating him. And he just turned to me and he said, well, that's nice of you to say, mom, but a lot of people helped me. And then he stepped back and he looked at me. He said, a lot of people helped me. And again, it was, I was confronted again with this sort of, you know, notion I had, even after a year of being in Al-Anon, that it's the individual hero who goes into recovery and struggles and does this all by themselves. But in 12 step, it's the, it's the community, it's the group that's, that's doing it. It's an incredible thing. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's very, um, one of the goals in this project, which I, I think ties in pretty directly to, to um, work that all of you have done as well um, in various ways uh, is working to eliminate stigma attached to addiction and to addicts themselves. And um, I'm just wondering if uh, you all have any thoughts about how we can work to reduce the stigma um, around addiction and also more generally around um, vulnerable marginalized uh, populations more generally, if anyone has any thoughts on that. I mean, there's a term that I only discovered many years after I had my own struggle, you know, uh, I mean, the struggle is permanent, but when I kind of really felt like I recovered and it was this concept of self-medicating, like somebody said, oh, you were obviously self-medicating. And I was like, huh, I never thought of it that way, but yes, you know, I, I, I mean, there's so many things we, we, we cannot and should not tolerate in this society, right? Uh, collectively, but also individually. Uh, so for example, uh, when, when a child or an adolescent leaves a home because they're being abused, you know, uh, you, you kind of need to not punish that child even more, right? But you need to understand them as making a major step, you know, as make a, and I feel like there's so many things that people who end up in addiction, uh, they end up there, but their initial drive was actually a very positive one. It was one to escape where while other people lived in denial and in conformity, right? Many people who, who start self-medicating are just not happy. They, they don't, you know, um, and there was a group, I believe in Chicago. I don't know if you remember like 20 years ago, they had these t-shirts that had an, had an unhappy face. Do you know this group? that we are depressed group, you know, and, and, and what they were pointing out is the absurdity of the happy face of this constant happy face in American society, you know? And I feel like this, this is a concept that perhaps would help reduce the stigma, not that, you know, it can solve everything that, but, but the idea that there are reasons for why we need self-medication and perhaps self-medication is not the best approach. Perhaps we need proper medication or, or not medication, but proper, health approaches, you know, um, but, but yeah. Yeah, that's such a profound point. Um, and I'm just reflecting on how many um, recovering people I've talked to who have commented that they feel like um, their addiction for a period in time kept them alive. <laughs> you know, until they, until it turned on them, but it was, it was how they, it felt like, it felt like the solution rather than a problem to being in this world. Um, and so I think that's a really, really interesting point to think about, like, so, so what is it that's going on that's underlying that and how can we work to address that as a, as a society? It makes me think about like early intervention type stuff as well. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite addiction counselors, uh, really in her first few sessions with a new patient, 
will embrace that ambiguity and that ambivalence that, you know, this, this drug solves some problems for me, some real problems in my life. And I don't want to give it up. This has been a, a friend on the cold nights. And, and, and I think that I keep coming back to a solution for all of society is just embracing contradiction. You know, we're not all liberal or conservative. We're not all addicted or healthy. We're, we're all broken in some ways and beautiful in some ways. And um, to embrace that, especially for people in the early days of recovery, I've explained to many of my you know, friends of other friends who are getting into recovery or parents of friends that you got to celebrate every baby step. Just because they relapsed after a week, you got to celebrate the first six days of that week. And you can't sell it. You can't get mired in the blame of the failure, but you have to find the celebration. So that's probably a contrast to Pedro's uh, embracing of, uh, <laughs> of difficulty. But, but yeah, we've got to embrace both in our world for, for so many reasons. Yeah, you're talking about the, you know, the, the original question was about this, how do we change this, some of the stigmatized attitudes that we have? Um, I mean, the, the language and the attitudes um, towards addicts and addiction in this country is, it, it's so punitive and so really hateful and, um, you know, unloving. And uh, I, I remember at one point when in the thick of this, at the beginning for me, my journey through this, I heard a story on, on NPR and it was about the opioid epidemic that was just really exploding. And uh, some little town in maybe Western West Virginia, Eastern Ohio. And it was a mayor of a city, uh, a woman. And there was a big uh, altercation in her community about whether or not the town should fund Narcan for cops to you know, keep in their cars because they were having such a problem with overdoses in public. And big, the public, the citizens were against it and blah, 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 blah. And NPR is interviewing this woman to ask her what her attitude is. And she said, it's pretty simple for me. I'm, I'm supporting spending the taxpayers' money to put Narcan in our police cars. Because when you get right down to it, in order to recover, you have to be alive. <laughs> I just thought, that's it, you know? We have to keep people, we have to try to do what we can to help people. Um, to who to find their way to recovery because like um, Nicole was saying like no one would choose this no one would choose to get to the point that we're talking about you know they get there you know as as Pedro was saying almost by accident they're trying to help themselves they're trying to keep themselves in the world in some way and that's to say nothing of the case of my family member was dual diagnosis you know it was bipolar one and the self medication was for that and just went down that road. And, you know, that's a whole other question and a whole other uh, really deep um, critical dimension of, of this problem. Yeah, and um, I don't know, I was also just thinking about how um, just around the subject of stigma, how different populations are stigmatized differently um, and different substances as well. I, For me, like I just, alcohol is a drug that is seen differently in our society, but I don't, I mean, it's, it's just, it's a drug. It just happens to be one that's, that's legal and treated differently, but you know, how differently we view, you know, some, um, you know, somebody that's drinking who happens to be well off in a certain tier of society who is white, um, you know, I'm just, for example, um, you know, versus someone that um, lives in a lower income neighborhood and is struggling with um, a crack addiction, for instance, and happens to be a person of color, that that's going to be just viewed completely differently. Um, and, you know, Pedro talked a little bit about how, how differently the opioid ep um, epidemic has been treated versus um, the crack epidemic. Um, so I think that is obviously a lot to discuss and get into as well, but I think it, it's important to mention as well. I mean, I think another uh, aspect that perhaps we can address, it, it, it doesn't only fit in connection with stigma, but 
is to just understand history a little bit more. Like uh, there's one of my favorite books on this topic is by Wolfgang Schievelbosch, this intellectual historian. Uh, he wrote a book called Taste of Paradise and each chapter is, is uh, kind of constructed around an addictive substance, you know? So there's one on coffee and how coffee became the thing that it became. There's one on sugar, you know, there's one on, on opium. And you can really understand world culture through, you know, and globalization and big economic trends. I mean, slavery, right? Like so many things, you know, were built around this notion of this specific substances, you know? And, and so just if we understand that, that it's not just about the last 20, 30 years that we're dealing with this issue, you know, of, because some, sometimes that's the impression that the, especially political forces want to give us that this is a new thing. And, you know, like, and, and, and I think at least I, I, to me, it helps to kind of take a step back and say, well, how have we as humans, you know, dealt with this issue in the law, in the big picture, you know, and, and then address it collectively, you know? Um, Absolutely. And I think looking through that lens also makes me think, uh, that it's important to look at who who is profiting financially is usually an important aspect to that um, to that story and historically it comes into play a lot um, because often when there is a group of people that's addicted to something and spending money to access that something there is another group of people that is profiting um, so I think that's yeah um, we have. I, I'm going to open it up to a Q&A in just a few minutes. Um, I, I wanted to, um, I had a question for Kate um, about your work and your poetry. Um, and, and there's this idea that you hear spoken about in recovery that pain shared is pain lessened. Um, and, um, and this idea that, that secrets kind of grow in the dark and that part of the solution lies in exposing the truth to the light. And that's part of what happens within 12 step programs. And um, I'm wondering if you found for yourself as someone who's intimately experienced this disease through a loved one's addiction, did you find that writing about your experiences and putting them out into the world served a purpose like that in your own life? Um, and more broadly, do you think work like yours or like mine can serve that purpose in the world as well? I mean, in, in a word, yes, you know, I mean, I, I'm one of those people who found, discovered when I was just really tiny, five, that writing had some kind of efficacious effects for me. Um, I enjoyed doing it, but I enjoyed even more at the after effects of it, you know, what I felt like afterwards. I felt clearer. I felt more organized. I didn't feel as confused. I didn't feel as anxious. So that was, you know, it was built in. It was a, the reward for doing it was built in the whole way. Um, I um, teach uh, workshops in, in my Nashville community called Writing for Recovery for people whose lives have been affected by other people's addictions. And this is the you know, sort of principles that they work along, right? Um, and I'm also um, part of a group of um, writers and, and psychotherapists who are we're just starting to do writing workshops for um, frontline healthcare workers who've been working in COVID um, care for the past year and are just totally burned out. So all these have to do with sort of writing in response to trauma and writing as a form of almost therapy, um, a certain kind of writing, almost as a form of therapy for responding to trauma. I, I don't, you know, you, what you talk about, I th think the phrase you said, you know, the 12 step phrase, secrets grow in the dark. Um, there's so much shame I've, I, among people um, who are suffering from substance use disorder. And I, it's, I think that's, you know, it's one of the, the, the most difficult things it seems to be to, to deal with, a big sort of hump to get over at the very beginning, to humble yourself and to realize, you know, the reality of the situation you're in and what you're facing. Um, I, I'm not sure that writing for me and the way that I use it in these workshops has to do with getting secrets out, but it's more getting what's inside out, whatever it is whether you know whether you think about it as a shameful secret or not and again these sort of clarifying organizing um, feelings of relief 
that most people have when they can manage to get their thoughts and their feelings down on paper or on a screen. Um, so yeah, the answer to your question for me is yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it, it makes me think too that the process of creation and creating art, whether it's poetry or visual art, like in my case, um, is also a process of human connection. You know, like we are creating the work for ourselves, but also there's a connection that happens in that sharing and in that exchange. Um, I wanted to ask a question to Pedro because uh, I feel like we've gotten a chance to hear a little bit more from Kate and Nicole about their own work, but I'm just wondering, um, for over 20 years, you've made art with all different kinds of social groups, both in person and remotely, and how do you see all of that experience that you've had relating to the artwork and topics that we've discussed here? Oh, gotta unmute you. Sorry about that. I think uh, the, the light is a bit strong here. Um, I think one of the, I also wanna make sure we talk about you you as an artist, right? Cause we're talking about the topic, but uh, so one of the, I mean, the, I think in part the richness of bringing these two things together, the topics that we've been discussing and addiction and recovery, right? Uh, and the topic of art is that uh, art can do amazing things that, that we can't just do in a clinical setting, right? So we've been talking about poetry, but also visual art. And, and I think one of the, my, in terms of my experience, but it, I wouldn't be surprised if it's your experience too and many other artists, we, we just, as, as many misunderstandings as there are about addictions, we have about art. Like there's so many stupid cliches and myths about what an artist is. And we just have to go against them. And we have to not just make different kind of art, but actually show the people that art never was that to begin with. I think to me, artists are people who care. Like most artists I've met, they care. They care about ideas. They care about emotions, but they care for other people. They, they're not... The, 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 the notion of the Jackson Pollock who drinks himself away into death and like and doesn't care about anyone else and just wants to express his own emotions at the expense of everything. It's just, it's such a bad cliche and a myth that we keep watching in these movies, right? And yes, it may reflect a certain version of male anxiety, but I do think art to me, my experience of art has been the contrary, that art is this incredible social, you know, phenomenon right and it has been historically and I just whether you make a painting or a socially engaged artwork it doesn't matter you know like it's it's something that um at times it's it, it's interesting how the very same if you read a lot of the worst cliches about the addicts and the worst cliches about the artists you could almost replace the name and they would still work you know and so uh, I feel like that's that's an important, even if people who don't necessarily have not worked on this topic of addiction, perhaps that would give them an access to understand why we care about this too, you know, even for those who haven't had that experience. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanna make sure um, <clears throat> we get a chance to get any questions from anyone who's here for, you know, they can, be to any of the panelists, they can be to me more broadly, and they can be about the art, the subject. Um, and I'm thinking the best way to do this um, is if you have a question or a comment, um, go to your chat and send an asterisk like that. And then we'll call or I'll call on people in the order that the asterisks appear. Also, if you're shy and you want to say something or um, raise a question, but you don't want to speak out loud, you're welcome to also send that in the chat as well. All right, awesome. I'm going to start with David Long. Sorry, it took me a while to figure out how to unmute. <laughs> um, first of all, I really appreciate being invited um, to, to uh, listen to this panel. Um, really been a great experience. I, I wanted to ask you a question, Mariah. Um, I, I know that creating the art that you did um, had a therapeutic value for you. Um, I wonder if um, any of the people who um, provided the texts provide the subject for some of your pieces, 
expressed that, that seeing your work proved to be therapeutic for them. Now I was speaking while muted. Um, the answer is yes, absolutely, which has been a really, um, really, really meaningful for me. Um, and what's been really neat, so one of the participants in this project um, uh, witness, like saw some of these pieces when I had them um, displayed last year before the pandemic, because I mentioned some of those earlier pieces related to addiction as well, and, and saw herself in those pieces. And it was during a point in time where she was still in her active addiction. And there are some of the darkest, kind of heaviest pieces. Um, one in particular is the one um, where she talks about shooting up in her car and seeing the shadow descend. Um, so she saw the work at that point in time. And um, since then she has gotten clean, yay, I'm cheering for her and she's, um, but she is the same person who ended up being in the piece where I'm saying, you know, I can't, you know, you have a year clean. So she celebrated a year clean through this process. And so um, I don't, I don't wanna speak for her, but I can say, because she's shared with me that it's been really amazing to, because I think even when someone is in, in when someone is in active addiction, um, they're still like wanting something that's happening to them to be of help to someone else. You know what I mean? Like they're still like wanting other people to not be suffering. And so if, if their work can go into the world and touch somebody in a meaningful way, a lot of times they would still want that. So I think the being a part of the project was meaningful then, but I think it's even more meaningful now with time and distance. And so that's really, I get a lot of, a lot of joy out of that. Um, I hope I answered your question, Nathan. Um, Jay Hoon. Hey, yeah. Also want to thank you for uh, having, creating this space and, and hosting this. Uh, my question was uh, a lot of times when you're creating art, it takes a lot of intentionality, but also a lot of kind of following your instincts and, and your intuition. And I'm curious about which parts from, you know, medium, like how you got caught in some of the technical aspects and intentional versus where did you just trust yourself to just what's in your heart and just put it out there, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I would have a text message occur um, come across a text message, so to speak, that felt worthy of collecting. Kind of like if you're a collage artist and you come across something in a magazine and you like the texture, the color, you crop, you know, so I would just screenshot, save, screenshot, save. Um, and then, you know, find myself kind of sitting with those words and certain images would come to me, some of them really easily and immediately, and some would be a struggle. And so there's a couple pieces um, that I actually have done with more than one image, which can be an interesting element um, to kind of play on how differently those images um, interact with the words. Um, and I just, so I think it's like largely an intuitive process, but then it involves me like stepping back and saying like, does this work? And is it creating and communicating what I want it to. And if not, maybe I scrap it and start over. Um, and I liked, you know, the idea of hand drawing, <laughs> like each of those letters, it's like a very deliberate and slow and intentional process. It's just the opposite of like rapid fire, firing off a text and then taking it one step further to make the cyanotype, which is for those who aren't familiar it's a, it's a very, very old photographic process of ex using sun to expose chemicals on paper and create a print where you're, you're literally reliant on the sun. So it's about as analog as you can get. It's about as far off from a text message as you can get. So taking it to this form of just, you know, making it really kind of, kind of memorializing the words in that way and giving them a significance and preserving them. Um, which I think has always been an impulse in my work more generally, um, but is certainly at play in this project um, as well. And I think uh, I really enjoy playing with, um, in terms of the image selection, 
having images that can be interpreted different ways and, and have elements of humor is funny because Pedro and I have had conversations about this looking at the work. Um, you know, like they're like some of them are like they're funny, you know, and it can be like really heavy content, but like there is allowed to be humor in it all, you know. Um, so yeah, hopefully I answered you as well, James. Very well, thank you. Yeah. Julia. Hi. Thank you so much for, for kind of creating this space, facilitating this conversation. Um, I had a question about how you've seen um, access to art or art, the process of creating art um, as a part of 12-step recovery programs. So whether, um, so thinking about um, your, your pieces speak to the disruption that happened with not being able to be in person and thinking about whether this type of artistic reflection and creation could be a way to um, deepen, the deepen connection in these disrupted circumstances. Like if art is a, if you've seen art be a part of recovery in intentional ways that you think are, are helpful, I guess. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, I ha it's it's not something that exists within like the framework of twelve step recovery, but I think that it's something that I certainly have known a lot of recovering people who also happen to be artists at the same time, um, for whom art becomes a really important and integral part of their life and their recovery. Um, and I think also, you know, as I mentioned earlier. Um, people are recovering in different ways from different things. And, you know, one of the things I had the opportunity to do in undergrad was volunteer with an organization where we would take art into psychiatric units. Um, so people were there for many different reasons. It wasn't substance abuse particular, and we weren't doing art therapy per se, but what we were doing is just kind of bringing in the resources and the time and kind of laying them at their fingertips and being like, you know, this is a chance to kind of explore these materials and express yourself. And, um, you know, ideally, I think one of the things that happens for me that's so wonderful is you can enter that kind of flow state where you're just creating and you're not thinking about all that other stuff for a little while, which I think is tremendously valuable. Like if if a patient can forget for 45 minutes that they're in the hospital and simply like lose themselves in the act of what they're doing, then I think that that was successful. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there is like huge, and that's huge potential for um, that being a tool and resource for people that are struggling from with many, many different things. Um, yeah, if I can add to that, I mean, I think that's that's really important for, especially for artists who have addiction issues, right? Like the one, one first myth we have to let go of is that you have to use to be creative and to make art. Um, and, and once you get past that, you realize like for, like in my case, the three or so years that I had the biggest issues with alcohol were actually the very years when I made the least amount of art. And it's, it's we often see it in the uh, inverse direction, but basically, as you very well described, it's the art making process that that actually very often helps us. And so that's for practicing artists, but but that process of art making, you know, uh, as this di different way of time flowing in that person's consciousness, right? And 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 not thinking about the substance, you know, I think is is has huge potential, you know, even for non practicing artists. Yeah. I'm I'm really struck by by what you just said, Pedro, and then what Mariah said before about, and I don't know anything about visual arts, but about her process and how slow it was. And she, what did she say? There's hardly anything more analog. And the word that kept coming into my mind as she was speaking and also as you were just speaking was mindfulness. And that you know, to slow time down and to get just in the moment, right? Be here now, you don't look back, you don't look forward, you stay in the moment. And just the, um, I'm having a new, appreciation for this project of yours, Mariah, because of the way that you took the opposite of that, these fleeting ephemeral messages that disappear almost instantly. And then you figured out a process that's very slow, very mindful, but somehow as, as, as Pedro, I think was suggesting, 
includes elements of the mental, the new mental habits, you know, people need to develop or to focus on to get into recovery. It's really wonderful. I'm, I'm so glad you talked about how you actually brought the images and the text into being. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I hadn't, I had not thought about that connection in that way. That's really, really interesting. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And I have an asterisk from Carr, but I don't think it showed up for everyone, but I think he had a. Oh, it did, thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me, Mariah. This is really, it's been really fantastic. And I, I think the work looks great. Um, so, I don't know. My question, I suppose, is, um, you know, you, you talked about wanting to, um, I don't know, tap into the recovery communities, especially how they're dealing with the pandemic uh, and things like that. I don't know, is there, I suppose there's not any hard evidence, but um, did you find anecdotally that, um, I don't know, fewer, I don't know, I don't know what I'm asking. Fewer, is it, has it been harder for uh, addicts this year to get into recovery? Um, yeah, and, the and, and maybe even, I was actually thinking, uh, when Nicole was talking about, you know, childhood trauma and things like this, I mean, is this something that's going to show up in, you know, the next decades for all the children who've been going through the pandemic now? I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know anyhow, but go ahead, Ryan. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, there, I feel like someone could write a thesis about the question you just asked. There's so much, so much inside of that. Um, I think, we do know that there has been, to, to the latter, your latter points, there, there, we know that there have been increased abuse of children and of others during the pandemic. We know that mental health, I mean, I, mental health in young people has like taken a major hit. So, I mean, I, I have no doubt that there is an impact that will be seen and felt. Um, as far as how the re recovery community has fared, it was interesting because I was actually looking up a little bit, wondering about like overdose statistics. And I think, you know, for, and, and, the, and I think, you know, there's, there's always like a little bit of a delay in collecting that kind of, that kind of research. So I don't know that we really know in that regard yet. Um, I think one of the things there certainly have been, um, I mean, I'm tempted to kind of use the word casualties um, in the sense that, you know, there, there have been people, I, would bet my life on it and there have been people that you know needed help and had a harder time accessing it as a result of the pandemic and died um you know um i know that you know there's there's one just anecdotally like you mentioned there's one one of the drawings the one where you see the poppy flower and i say that um i say that you know one of my best friends just found her, her boyfriend dead of an overdose and I'm so glad you're still here. Um, you know, I know that he, that, that young man who, who passed away during the pandemic, um, you know, she had been trying to encourage him to attend some Zoom meetings and um, there had been some resistance to that. It was just a different format. And I, I can't, I certainly can't hold that entirely responsible, but I think, it has been a factor for people in increased isolation. And um, then on the flip side, something that's happened that's been really beautiful is that the recovery community has, people have been able to connect with each other across geographical distances, which is really amazing. You know, like going to, you know, there's people in the United States that are like, oh, I'm gonna go to a meeting in Ireland tonight, you know, or people going to meetings in places where they used to live and being able to connect or, go hear a friend speak at a speaker meeting, you know, those kinds of things, um, which is really beautiful and cool and what's happening and increases accessibility in some cases. I've talked to addicts who said, you know, I have health issues and it makes it really difficult for me to get out and go to a meeting, but I'm making so many more meetings now that I can tune into Zoom, Zoom meetings. So it's, it's, it's very complicated and, and again, like not black and white. And I think what's gonna be interesting is coming out of the pandemic, the majority of meetings are still over Zoom. There are meetings that are happening in person now as well, but there are some meetings that um, are gonna kind of opt for a hybrid option so that people have the opportunity to attend both ways, which is interesting because there are, there are advantages. And I will say, 
online meetings have been around for a long time. That's not a brand new thing, but just never with this degree of attendance um, and never as like the only option. So it, it kind of it was a game changer in that regard, but it's not like online meetings are a brand new concept either. Um, did I touch on your questions at least? Okay. Uh, Andrea. Oh, oh, did I'm sorry, Andrea. Nicole mentioned asking Nicole if you had any insights on that question. Oh, yeah, I was going to say um, there is a ton of data. I, I keep up with the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services overdose data reporting from emergency departments. And it looked like in 2019 that the opioid epidemic was starting to make the turn and take a decline. And then the, the pandemic hit and overdose visits to emergency departments have gone right back up. Uh, and then the other thing that um, Carr touched on was, you know, abuse, childhood abuse and trauma. That's, that's way up. I have a collaborative project with our uh, Durham County Jail. And when uh, so many were released because we wanted to reduce the risk of COVID, uh, my colleagues in the sheriff's department said the only people left are people from domestic abuse, domestic violence cases. Um, but then on the other hand, I hope that um, we've all learned to pause and take a few moments and, and try to build, try to find new ways to build resilience, like you said, and have the game changer be that we can find so many more ways to reach out to each other. But short answer to Carr's question is yes, there's a ton of data on it and you're absolutely right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and then there's also the inverse look at that picture you just described about the prisons, right? If you think that so many people who suffer from addiction are in prison, and we think how terrible COVID has been in prisons, and how terrible the treatment of people has been, you know, like then certainly people who, you know, uh, the, the, the pandemic has had a negative influence on people with addiction. You know, so. Yes, hugely. And I, I think I, I spoke about that a little bit in my talk in the beginning is that the, the capacity to bring meetings into jails and prisons. Like that's a, like people that are recovering inside of institutions rely on that. It's like a lifeline and all of that had to shut down. Um, yeah, so um, Andrea. Yeah, so thank you. Um, for making this work and um, for inviting me to be part of this. Um, I have a lot of thoughts swirling around. Um, so I'm going to try to um, ask you something particular um, to, to all the panelists, especially to Mariah. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of talk about shame and stigma associated with this disease. Um, and, you know, there's, there's been, there's a lot of challenges, but a lot of the success that has been attributed to um, the, the successes that the LGBTQ community has had in gaining acceptance um, has been around uh, personal stories of coming out, right? So it's, it's a population that was um, that was secret largely for a lot of human history, um, a lot of our society. And then there was this movement to uh, for for individuals to come out and to and for people to have these relationships with people that they cared about that suddenly are part of that population, right? Um, and so I was thinking about that and the the sharing, but also the secrecy, you know, that you've been talking about in the 12 step recovery program. And also the, the public nature of the art that you've made here. Um, but, but it's not like Demi, Lo Demi Lovato's uh, song about dancing with the devil that I heard on the radio, you know, <laughs> it's not this, uh, <laughs> it's not this sort of everyday addiction story that we hear that's everywhere. It's this um, intentional art that you've made about um, something that's commonplace, but intimate, text messages, right? They're like the most intimate communications, the most commonplace things that we 
all encounter in our daily lives. And I was thinking about the fact that that, that um, intentionality of focusing on that really commonplace, but really intimate communication and outing it um, is just very, I think, poignant in this dialogue that we're having. And I was wondering how you saw your art in that context. Yeah, there's so much to discuss there too. Thank you. That's really, um, that's really, really interesting. Um, yeah, so, and it, it is, it is a very, so the kind of the question, questions around anonymity um, are very complex. Um, and I think, you know, this work, one of my, uh, one of my goals in this work is to kind of shed light and make this thing that is so intimate to share it, right? But also to, while doing that, protecting the anonymity of the particular uh, people that, because any person, you know, like, like Pedro was sharing a little bit of his own history. Any person has the right to decide that for themselves, but don't have the right. And it's kind of the same thing, in, you know, with the LGBTQ community, you don't really have a right to out somebody else, at least you shouldn't, you know, outing yourself is different. Um, so, but it's interesting, there was a documentary that came out a few years ago and I actually have not seen it, but it's been on my like to watch list. It's, I think it's called The Anonymous People. And it's, um, you know, I think it's a, a, a large number of celebrities in the recovery community that are sort of pushing for like more openness about being in recovery and thinking that that's an important aspect of breaking stigma. Um, it's very complicated because um, in 12 step programs, there are 12 steps and there are also 12 traditions and the 12 traditions are um, what has, allowed the groups to function and survive and thrive for so long. Um, and one of them is, um, it says our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion, ever reminding us to play, I'm sorry, that's not. No. Um, it, it says that we um, protect personal anonymity at the level of press, radio and films. Um, and so there's an idea that, uh, and there's like multiple multiple reasons for that. Um, one of which is this concern that if someone comes out and says, um, hi, I'm a member of this specific 12-step program, then they can easily become representative of that in people's eyes. And people can say, oh, I know her and I don't like her. And she's the only person I know from AA. So that person then becomes kind of representative of that recovery program. And so, um, you know, that's, that's one of the main concerns that, that I see. Obviously, there also is the concern of, um, you know, the individual not wanting to face consequences in their own lives of other people's judgment, you know, like to be able to have a new free life and not necessarily have everyone know you as um, an addict publicly. Um, and there can be consequences to someone's career and social life and things like that. Um, so I think it's uh, it's a very big and very complicated question, and I have a lot of thoughts on it that you and I will have to like <laughs> have a longer conversation about it later because it's it's a big one. Did I at least kind of touch on what you were asking? Yeah, I, I think I think so. Um, I, it just really struck me how your art was was about this like intimate communication as opposed to these sort of like other artworks about addiction that we see. Um, and I think that's, that's something that, that struck me um, as this, as a different parallel to the LGBTQ movement um, where it's like, it was the success was built on these sort of intimate relationships. Um, so, um, but I, I appreciate what you're saying about also, you know, um, the anonymity, right? And the, the becoming a um, 
a spokesperson. <laughs> um, it's very interesting. And I mean, also, I think, you know, it's the 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 one thing that I feel like it's not it's not the coming out analogy is interesting because I feel that legalization is an important conversation we have to have as a society, but it's different from addiction, right? Like, you know, for example, we know that people suffer from alcoholism. That doesn't mean we're going to go back to prohibition. <laughs> no, I, it, they're separate conversations, you know, but both can meet over the notion of health, you know, and public health. And so I feel like with so many drugs that the stigma and the secrecy, so much of that stuff comes from it from certain things being illegal of course each drug is different right and i think nicole can best tell us which ones we should definitely wear, be warier of in terms of you know giving access to people but but i do think this uh i mean of course marijuana has been the most obvious example of that you know but of, of, of a movement towards decriminalization and legalization but but the coming out perhaps can have a positive effect there right but 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 when people have been addicts, it's not there. It's it's harder to be proud, you know. Even if of proud of being an addict, you know, like it, you know, you're. It's not something. What that's different than saying if you use something recreationally and you have it under control, uh, which a lot of people manage to do. That's a different story, you know. Um, yeah, and I think. Um... Two, two things that kind of popped up for me while you were talking, um, jumping back a little bit, but the question of um, ramifications of breaking one's anonymity, it also reminds me of something that Kate was talking about earlier, how she talks to all of her other family members as well, because if you decide to come out publicly, there are other people that are impacted by that process as well. Um, but the other thing that I was just thinking about that was really kind of interesting about the history of Narcotics Anonymous is that, you know, in the beginning, you know, groups had to meet in secret because it's illegal for, there's laws in effect about the number of felons that are allowed to gather. And, you know, kind of by default, <laughs> there's large numbers of felons, you know, and so it had to be kind of this secret society in the beginning as a, res as a result of that. And so that's just a, always been a very interesting kind of historical detail of, of the history of that program. Um, I'm going to move on to make sure we get everybody. Um, George. Thanks, Mariah. Uh, your exhibit is incredibly powerful. And to the panel, that's been a fascinating compelling discussion. Thank you all. Uh, real quick, early on, Nicole said, nobody chooses addiction, but you can choose recovery. Uh, any of you have thoughts about how to explain choosing recovery to those who are in the throes of addiction? You know, what does choosing look like? And then has the new forced isolation of the pandemic affected that whole difficulty of choosing recovery? Thanks. Yeah. I can take a stab at that, but I just wanted to, did any of the other panelists want to attempt it first? <laughs> um, you all are not holding back with the challenging questions. I appreciate it. Um, it's a really hard question. I think that um, you, it's, you can't, no one else has the power to decide for someone else when they're at their bottom and when they're done and ready to get help. And anyone who has loved an addict has firsthand experience with that, with wanting to just shake them and force them to get better. And it just does not work that way. And in my experience and my witness that there's something that happens and in recovery, the phrase hitting bottom is used. Um, that is just this this combination of, for whatever reason, a point of desperation that leads to willingness um, is reached within the individual that makes them willing to take whatever action necessary to get help. And I have seen that happen for people who um, at so many different points in their stories, you know, some people, um, earlier on when their addiction hadn't progressed as far, some people after like many, many repetitive 
you know, years of challenges and it, it just took what it took for that point to be reached. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, and that is why efforts such as interventions that, are, that happen on the part of loved ones, um, while certainly valid and understandable and sometimes effective, often or not, just because um, that individual has to make that choice for themselves that they're that they're that they're done and that they're ready. And um, at that point in time, I think um, what that looks like can be different for different people, but um, it often involves going into some kind of um, detox or recovery center to, you know, detox substances out of their system, um, getting professional help. Um, sometimes that involves, especially if there are dual diagnosis issues that play mental health issues that can involve medications of various sorts, um, therapies, uh, and very frequently, such as in the case of this project, involvement in 12-step program in which the individual um, asks a sponsor who is somebody who has already worked the steps, has been in recovery for a length of time themselves to sponsor them and to take them through the steps themselves um, and share their experience and strength and hope with them. Um, I'm gonna see if any of the other panelists have anything that they wanna say in regards to that question. I'll say something. I mean, this, it's an incredible question, but this is to me is the central mystery of addiction and recovery. Why do some people get to recover and some people don't? I don't, I know we use the term choosing recovery in 12 step very frequently. I'm not sure how accurate that is because it just seems like some kind of mystery to me that I can't figure out. I, I, I mean, there are certain things that we think we know, you know, in family programs and treatment centers all over the country that are now about 50 years old, you know, typically tend to agree that after access to healthcare or treatment, um, the, the main determinant of whether or not a person is going to get into recovery is family support, by which they mean healthy family support, you know, not unhealthy family support. But what does that look like and what does that mean? Um, so I don't know what to say. It's, it's just an extraordinarily, uh, like you've been, I, one of the things I appreciate so much, Mariah, about all the things you've been saying is your constant reminding, reminders that this is such a complicated um, situation. There's so many different factors and there's so much ambiguity in all aspects of it. And um, I appreciate that very much. Well, and that's also another thing about why that hitting rock bottom thing is so, it's such a deep layered image. Like we have a shovel there, we have death, we have gravity, right? And the notion of not choosing addiction, I think has to do with inertia, right? Like uh, basically, I mean, entropy, right? Like heat, like the universe going to heat as waste, you know, energy, like basically, if you don't do anything, you fall, right? So, so choosing means getting up, you know, it, it means not letting that force, you know? So for people who have experienced addiction, I think they have that, a lot of us have had that sense of, of just the, the, the inertia, the gravity, right? And we have to do something, we have to choose otherwise, you know? And, uh, but, but there's also perhaps, again, to bring in art, like there may be there, one of the myths about art, which is uh, debatably a myth, I think, at least I would like to think, is that when an artist is good, he or she makes something really difficult look effortless. But even a statement like that can only exist because people weren't there in the studio or, you know, or in the musical, like witnessing the hours and hours of Glenn Gould practicing, you know? And so I think, with addiction, we know that it's not, it, it, but it may, we may actually know people who recovered and they made it look so easy. So maybe ask them, you know, and, and ask more questions about it. But like, there's, uh, the, the, I think too many people look for it, in my experience, for the lofty answer, like, you need to find purpose, you need to find meaning. Yes, that works for some people. But for others, it's getting a pet, you know, and like, I, I, I think perhaps that's also the big success of AA, right? that it's about a community and you find the person that is that has the closer answer to you because of the kind of person you are not because there's one solution you know so so um 
it's yeah but i i agree you know with kate like i i don't i don't know it's it's a really difficult one you know yeah yeah and i think um i was just thinking about a point that kate made about the air recognizing the shades of gray and how complex it all is and then also recognizing the importance of family support and i was just thinking about those two things in combination because i have seen just anecdotally in my experience times when family support was like completely core and essential to saving somebody's life and also times in which family support was truly a hindrance because it was being done in a way that that was enabling and um and not helpful you know and so it's just this like very it's just it's always so complex um and it made me think about that i think we have one more asterisk and i know we were gonna Try to wrap up around six o'clock, six thirty. But I wanted to hear if Phil had a question still. Yes, I do. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. I really have enjoyed this, and I've enjoyed all the participants a great deal. And uh, I wanted to say that I really liked Kate's poem uh, without metaphor, and I just like that concept a lot. And I sort of wondered if you had anything to do with choosing that poem if that was like one of her poems that you really liked and you wanted her to read it, or if Kate just chose to read it. Uh, and because it's so good and it, it's, a, it's like got a connection to your work uh, because you can't really tell with your work whether it's a metaphor with the words and the object or, or it's like a simile or which, which type of magic it is, you know, uh, which connection uh, it is to make that. Uh, so, I'm not sure what the question is there. And maybe I there. I, maybe I, I, there. <laughs> I got your question. It was clear okay. as day to me. Yeah, no, it's you hit the nail on the head. So I I did pick that poem and ask Kate to read it. Um, and she graciously agreed to. I don't know if it's one of her favorites or not, but I know for me, I sat down and read a few of them. And that one, um, I have also, you know, not with one of my children, but I have experienced um loving someone who was in active heroin addiction and not knowing if they were going to make it or not and so the poem hit me in the gut and i i i felt it very viscerally um but then i did think that there was a really interesting um interaction between that poem and my work in particular because of exactly what you said is that these pieces are constructed with some degree of, of kind of visual metaphor, you know, and just these these different layers of meaning and, and seeing different layers of meaning in um, the images that have been chosen to be paired with the text. And so I thought the contrast between that um, on the addict side of the perspective and what she was writing from the mother's side um, was just really interesting and thought provoking to me. And so I wanted to kind of play with that a little bit. So you picked up on it, even if you didn't know quite what it was. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, did you have anything you wanted to add about that, Kate? I don't know if you do or not, since I kind of requested that poem in particular. I don't, yeah, but I was just surprised that you chose that one. I didn't ask you why you did, but yeah, uh, it wouldn't have been the one I would have chosen. But um, I, I, I understand no, more now why you did. And actually, I hadn't thought of the way in which the, the sort of the use of metaphor you know, it's sort of connected with the visual arts too. So that that's very, very interesting to me. So I think that one of the ways that I always got through my life without recourse to substances was through writing, which has this, you know, obviously deeply metaphorical level to it and it transported me somewhere else. So one of the shocking situation conditions that I found myself in as the mother of a heroin addict was metaphor was of absolutely no use to me, whatever. And metaphor is not of any use in 12 step. You know, those silly slogans that I was so condescending about as a poet and an English professor before they <laughs> essential to my psychic survival. It is what it is. I mean, there's no room for metaphor in that. You can't change it. You have to just look at and face the situation that you're in. And so that's where that, that poem comes from. And obviously that is very related to your project. So thank you again for it. Thank you. Thank you for writing it and sharing it with us. Um, <clears throat> We were gonna stop at around 6.30. So I just wanna, is there anybody with any final questions? Um, I'm gonna ask 
Christian, did you send the link to the, I'm gonna here, I'm gonna send it, it won't let me. I can Wait. pop it, I can pop it in the chat one Do you mind, just in case, and then. Um, there it is. Yeah, and if anybody um, wants to get in touch with me or any of the panelists directly, our, work, our information should be at the end of that um, exhibit, right, Christian? It's on the if it's on the event page, and we'll make sure that there's a link from the from the exhibit page to the event page, so people okay. can see who was here. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for coming. Deeply appreciated. And thank you so much again to our panelists. I want to virtually clap for our panelists um, for coming and participating with us. Thank you.